How's it going, doggy people? I hope you all are doing well. Today we're going over a video by Will Atherton, uh, otherwise known as Fenrir Dog Training. I don't know if he's still associated with that. He changed his channel name, so that might be two different entities, but this is Will Atherton. Um, he is a, another very popular dog trainer, um, which is great. You know, he, he promotes a lot of positivity, but you can say one thing and do another. So I'm going to cover him and show you what I see uh, versus what he says, which is why I cover different trainers. I try to critique them. This is being used under Fair Use Act for criticism and educational purposes. So he's going to teach you how to, uh, how to train dogs to walk to heal. So he's just like a lot of other people, a lot of other trainers who are very obsessed with this healing behavior. Now, if you if you have a dog that pulls, you can still teach them to walk loose on leash and they don't have to heal. Having heal as the only option to me just seems a little controlling, but we're going to see how he teaches. It's pulling really badly. Maybe they're pulling like this guy. Okay, so that, ouch, really is already very painful. This person, I like that they have a nice wide flat yeah, buckle collar about the top. Um, because it it's nice and spread out for surface area on the dog's throat, but I don't like how you see they have a leash lock. They're very short on the leash. They're trying to teach the dog to pull, or not to pull, they're trying to teach the dog to not pull and heal. And by doing so, they just constantly correct it by going up and up and up. And that creates them creates more anxiety and it makes the dog want to pull Tips more. That help me so take it we had a little lip lick, all the, way the dog is getting frustrated, they're trying to, to run. In just one session. And so now we already see it looks like he has a prong collar on the dog. Um, different leash, different style, so I don't know if there is prong collar on the dog or not. It could be a martingale, but I don't know why he would choose a martingale with a chain over just whatever they already had, which already looked like a martingale collar. Um, I could be wrong, but we'll see. The first thing when it comes to having your dog walk beautifully on a loose lead is understanding the importance of the loose lead and making... Which is a human concept. The dog does not understand, for one, why they have to be tethered at all. Uh, secondly, why they need to walk by our side. And thirdly, why they have to be on a loose leash and walk at our slow pace, or they can't stop and sniff when they want to. It's all about you pay attention to me, the human, you know, with my ego and whatever, even if you're not, you know, ego or, or, or in for sport or anything like that. It's still a human concept that we are trying to teach the dogs, but we put accountability on the dog instead of ourselves. And learning how to communicate with the dog to teach them so the dog does not have to be corrected for a very normal behavior such as pulling while on a tight leash. If I had a tight leash constantly around me, I would try to pull too. Sure that you're not ever providing tension on the lead, which ultimately is communication to your dog, unless you are consciously aware of exactly why Ouch. you're adding tension. Okay, agreed. I'm glad that he pointed that out, that it's unnecessary tension. Absolutely right. And a lot of people don't know that they're doing it. And this guy has loud hands. He's jerking up on the leash. He has really tight uh, you know, grip on the lead. He takes in all the slack. So this dog can't give you the right answer. For what purpose? With impeccable timing. I need to get out of these habits. The, the wrapping up. Yeah, yeah. Very good, because that can be very dangerous. If you have a very strong dog, it can take off. It can cause rope burns. At the very least, it can... Uh, you know, pull you down, it can cause amputation or dislocation of the arm and shoulder and all that stuff. Okay, sorry, I'm back. If you heard any kind of coughing, or if you do hear any coughing in the background, my dog is just dealing with uh, a little bit of acid reflux. Um, Adonis doesn't feel too well, but he's just chilling in the background. We, we got him on some medication. He's you know, getting taken care of, so um, just had to take care of that real quick. But uh, back to the video. So we have a beautiful little dog here. Um, this is what he's talking about, wrapped around the hand. You're trying to take in as much control as you can, and by doing that, you actually make the issue worse. Um, beautiful little dog, looks like a little Staffordshire uh, terrier, but... Ola, ...which is getting him jacked up and aroused, which is starting the crocodile. A little bit nervous. So we see that as the camera person comes in, the dog is is looking away. Their you know, tongue is hanging out, their, their tail, I don't know what their tail is doing, it's not really high, so they're a little bit nervous. Um, Nice wide collar though, um, but I think people think by doing this that you're going to have more control over your dog, which I'm fine with the collar being nice and wide if you're going to be walking a dog, but you don't need to have this kind of control on them. Again, I walk with a harness as well. I walk with a collar and a harness. Either one, I teach a dog to walk in both, even though most of the time I'm walking in a harness. Crocodile roll to get out of it. It's just. Oh my god. Whoa. Okay. So, dude, this dog can't even lay down. This guy doesn't even notice that. This dog is trying to get comfortable. Lip lick, 
it cannot even lay down because he has such a short leash on and this guy doesn't even notice it that it's choking jesus okay so finally the dog goes into little death roll you know alligator roll like dude you're choking me i can't breathe so he might go into a little panic and then the guy realizes and he lets go of the leash um, and it's just because he's but then he's still jerking up again and takes away that that slack and he's just talking about you know he's still talking i'm assuming while watching this he's just talking the whole time he doesn't see that i would tell him like loosen your leash give your dog six feet of their leash and then we will go on about you know showing you how to teach them not to pull Steady myself in it yeah. I'm ready for again so now he's like right here so as if that wasn't enough he's like right here it's just like when you know he has no concept of quiet soft hands and handling of a dog this is pressure right here so when i'm working with a dog or you know pressure and release and whatnot you know with horses when people have their hand underneath the chin of the horse under the halter they're constantly in their face they're nagging he's just over controlling this dog thinking he has more control when he's just irritating the dog the dog can't lay down they can't sit down they can't breathe they're stressed out they're showing it in their body language and he thinks it's just the pulling when you're working with dogs it's the whole thing that's why we teach the owner not the dog the dog knows how to be a dog the dog knows perfectly well how it can can listen to us and adapt to us as humans of how to learn to not pull on a leash but it's the humans that need to understand that it's us and that it's more than just the pulling. It's about how controlling you are with the dog, how you hold the leash, how short you hold it, how tight you hold it. Do you know how to have soft hands? Do you know how to let it go and slide through your hand and bring it in without being loud and jerking and popping at your dog? The pull, exactly. and I'm ready for right, it. So the dog is getting frustrated because control, control, control. He's just, the tool he's to just nagging the dog, jerking it around. Yeah. 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 But that's and it's we're... nothing personal against the owner. Like, I'm just, I'm just being honest. Okay, this is, it's, I will admit, it's much easier to be honest with strangers <laughs> over the internet, you know, I'm keyboard warrior, whatever you want to say, than it is, it's much easier to do that than be in front of the person. Now, if I were working with this person, I would tell them, I would show them, you know, here, just hold on to the end of the leash and let go of the rest. You know, you need to give your dog some leash because the more you try to hold them back, if you grab them by the, you know, uh, someone by the collar of their shirt, the more you hold them back, the more they want to fight it. That's just natural. That's opposition reflex. It's a reflex. We don't think about it. It's instinctual. If I try to push him, he's going to stop and try to fight that push until, you know, if I continue pushing, pushing, he's going to keep fighting it until he figures out, okay, if I move forward, she stops pushing me. That's just an example. Same thing if I was trying to pull him back and he's fighting it, you know, a person or a dog. And as soon as they move in and I stop pulling, they say, oh, that's the right answer. Now you can teach many other ways that don't even involve pressure, but... I would be explaining this while probably showing them. You know, a lot of times I will take the dog's leash and show them, hey, this dog can walk all around me and they may be pulling and I'm correcting it and you don't even realize I'm correcting it because it takes that little pressure. I'm just using a finger's worth of pressure or I'm moving my body away and the dog comes to me. I'll put a link to my video in the description below of how I show what I'm talking about with pressure and release and how little it takes for me to move a dog and and with adonis and teaching them to be soft if you have a dog that's a really hard puller it's going to take a lot more pressure to get them to move into it because they're used to fighting it so when i say correct a dog it doesn't mean that i'm beating or popping them but i am applying pressure against their body in a way that moves them off balance and you can see that in the video because it's easier to watch than you know explain it by words and whatnot will absolutely help you with that today no problem the next step is making sure that you have the right tool for the job and so he's going to be talking about probably a special collar probably a slip lead he's a big fan of slip leads you know prong collars stroke chains uh other other tools you know e-collars whatever for me that flat buckle collar is perfectly fine enough and that and that leash is perfectly fine too um you know harness would be great too um, if this dog had a thinner collar on, then I would suggest a wider collar. Um, we, you know, if that's all they had, then we can work with that. But I would always suggest a wider, fatter, thicker collar because it's more surface area, so more comfort. The way a lot of these tools work, especially prong collars, is even though people will say that there's more surface pressure on a prong collar than there is on a flat buckle collar, that is actually incorrect because if we think about it, a prong collar has, I don't know, one or two millimeters per prong. So... However wide that is, even if it's a centimeter wide, 
there's their points versus an entirely flat collar. I'll try to put some pictures up here showing the difference that 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 collar, the square inch of that flat buckle collar still has so much more surface area than a prong collar. That's how the prong collars work or slip leads work because it, it causes pain and discomfort and digs into the throat. So the more you pull, you don't want to hurt. So you figure out to stop pulling. A lot of dogs, it doesn't do anything and it just makes them pull more. And so then they need a bigger, stronger collar, just like with horses. You need a bigger bit. You need a stronger bit. You need a shank bit. You need, you know, uh, uh, all sorts of things, you know, tie downs, all this. When we don't realize that it's us, that we need to learn how to communicate without requiring special tools. The reality is that there isn't one size fits all. No, actually, I would say there is that I've accomplished plenty well. It's just a regular flat buckle collar that fits uh, appropriately to the dog's size of body. I mean, you're not going to get a two inch wide collar like this for a chihuahua. You know, it would be like it would fit around your body. But a heart, but for any small dog of chihuahua or anything like that, I always require a harness. I never put them on collars because they're just too tiny and they're very delicate. But Beside a flat buckle collar or a harness, that will work for any dog and every dog. Every dog's different. Every case is different. And so they like to say this to say, no, your dog is special. Your dog requires this. Although they use it on every single dog. They use a prong collar. I'm not saying him specifically, but trainers like this will use a prong collar with every dog. They use a slip lead with every dog. They use an e-collar with every dog. They never try anything else. They get them out of the harnesses. They'll put them maybe in the front clip harness. But if I have a harness or a collar, I can get any dog I work with. I can get them to walk on a loose leash with a harness that clips in the back. There's no gimmick of anything that, that clips in the front. It twists them around. There's nothing wrong with those. But I don't like how a lot of times they will hang right here. You can see this shoulder outline goes all the way out to here. And that means that this shoulder, if I have a harness, I want this shoulder to have free movement. So I like an X harness, uh, specifically one that allows free movement. It's, it, sorry, it makes an X kind of shape around the chest. So that way those shoulders can move freely. And I'm not relying on the tool to keep the dog walking like a penguin, you know, where his legs can't move. You okay, Baba? Good boy. Where his little legs can't move as they should because that can cause a change in gait it can cause other issues is different and there are many different variables to understand when it comes to which tool is the right one that you're going to need to use which is no tool you don't need to rely on a tool just use a harness use a collar i mean you use whatever you want if if you feel that you you need a special tool then by all means do that but to me that's the only thing that i ever need and really any dog ever needs it's again not the dog that needs the tool it's the humans that need them because they don't understand they don't want to take enough time they don't understand it's going to take time they don't have good timing and you can learn all this you don't have to pay anybody anything you just have to do your research and practice and practice you know where you're understand you know that it's going to take time and practice indoors where there's not a lot of distractions where your dog can get frustrated because they're not listening to you or you get frustrated because your dog's not listening to you and your dog will get frustrated that you're not listening to them to be able to have a beautiful loose lead heel walk so if you want your dog to stop pulling it's easy by using corrections it takes time and education and understanding of an animal's behavior to teach without corrections no secret that I'm a huge fan of utilizing a slip lead, mm -hmm. but there are times where I might have to go up to higher levels of tool to achieve the desired Correction, outcome. causing okay. more pain, meaning prong collars, shock collars, e-collars, even if it's on vibrate, that is still aversive enough to make the dog listen. Maybe jump straight to the prong for him and mm -hmm. get that arousal down quickly. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. I'm going to start with the slip. And just so he's going to act like the slip is nice and, and neat and, and soft. But again, it's a small cord for a large... If this were put around his throat or if we were to, to... If you were to pull with the length of cord that's around his neck and it was high up around his neck, it's going to hurt. He would stop pulling. And it's the same thing for dogs. I don't know why people can't put themselves in the dog's situation. They should. If you're ever going to, I always tell my clients, if you're ever worried about what kind of tool to use with your dog, put it on yourself in the same exact context. Go out to a busy area where you're nervous, where you want to get somewhere. Have someone with the height difference between you and the dog put a slip lead on you and tighten it and yank on it and jerk you and shock you and hit you with the prong collar and whatever. Do everything to yourself 
if you don't want it, that to happen to you, then don't do it to your dog. At the very least, you can imagine a child. Okay. Um, because you said you tried the slip and it not necessarily worked. I'm leaving so it probably work. just led the dog to pull more because they didn't... They just taught the dog to ignore that pressure around their throat. Dogs are probably going to move up. Um, but it might... Don't sound effect, but it might have been how you were using it more. Mm. So I'd rather... I'm just yeah, yeah, no. This is more going to be a bit of a test for me. Okay, so the dog is moving, lip, lip licking, because this tiny cord is high around his neck. So you notice the difference between this and this. This is more comfortable. It makes it easier for the dog to pull in. Not that it's not uncomfortable by choking itself, but this is so much more uncomfortable and painful. The dog runs out of oxygen more quickly with this than with this. And so it stops pulling. Of um, course. And then we'll go from there. Yeah. You guys kind of Dog's already kind there. coughing a little bit. He's going to want to come back to you. Ouch. So I can just... Ouch. Rex. Yeah, good boy. So he's going to show, yeah, I'm walking with two fingers. I can walk this dog with two fingers with the six foot leash on this flat buckle collar and even a harness. That's how I start with every dog. It's not because I'm special. It's because I've taken time. It's because I understand because I know it's going to take time. Quick results of this is easy. Ouch. Good boy. So then he corrects him. Yeah, good boy. You're not gonna you may not notice this, but pop. Ouch. Good boy. Didn't even give the dog a chance, didn't call him. Then the dog goes behind him and then he shortens the leash. Ouch, another correction. Pulls back. Ow, god dang good. it, dude. Sorry, I'm really trying not to, to <laughs> try not to say, you know, stuff like that, but ah. Uh. Rex. Ouch. Very, very hard. So how long has he been working with this dog? I don't know. But we had a cut there, you know, he's you're using a string. That hurts. Put a string around your own arm and consider tying a five pound weight to it and let it hang from your arm. With a thread with with a tiny piece of rope versus a belt. And then keep going up and wait. Because the amount of leverage that this guy has at this height with his strength and his center of gravity and all of that and all the physics versus how short this dog is, it's around the neck, it's around very sensitive area of nerves. That's the difference. So try that with yourself, and then you can put 20 pound weight on, on a little string around your arm. And then imagine it being around your throat. Hyper boy. <laughs> <Yeah>. Ouch. <laughs> We're gonna move so to he's still pulling. With it. Absolutely. We still can. pulling. Because he has a draw of his dad here. He's still pulling, and he doesn't care about this because he's nervous enough, and he has a draw enough to get to his dad. So he is effectively teaching this dog to ignore this straight down to it we've just this is how you get you know oh no he doesn't work well on a slip please you know so we need to get something bigger we need to use metal prongs in his throat then we need to use electricity it's just a stim it's just a touch it's just a, a spark if you have ever touched anything uh you know a car battery uh you're you're trying to you know change a car battery you go to plug something into a plug and something kind of sparks and shocks you what do you say you don't say it stimmed me you say it shocked me we're not saying you're getting electrocuted but it's enough to hurt right on the fingertips, they're very sensitive. Imagine that being around your, tight around your neck and you can't control it. And in some cases, yes, it just stimulates the muscle, but that's still painful enough to get the animal to respond. The slip lead, I'm fighting for his attention and I don't want to fight with him. Um, well, you're fighting for his attention because you haven't given him any reason to want to pay attention to you other than pain and pain compliance and avoidance of pain. If you had some treats, I'm sure he would love it. If you had a toy, I'm sure he would love it. I see some kind of, you know, it looks like maybe a Thor hammer. It's like a dog Thor. I don't know. Or it looks like a little tug toy here or something, you know, to chew on. If you actually acted exciting, the dog might want to go to you instead of just being jerked around and popped around you. I would ignore you, too the downside of a slip lead and which what you were doing because now you're strong so i'm wrapping yeah, yeah, up yeah. and now to control you i'm i'm tense and taut but hopefully he's like that in the first place happens is you'll see that energy come down no it ouch ouch so prong of course he means by energy going down it means pain compliance it means the dog is shutting down the dog is avoiding and becoming more fearful because they're trying to avoid pain. In some cases, it can be learned helplessness. So when people see results, they don't care how you get them. They just want the results. The end result could be a dog that's totally shut down, but we see it as, oh, they're compliant. We're starting to see already. Ouch, 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 ouch. Because he starts ouch. to understand, oh, I can't do Now, the dog was already standing there, and he continued to correct. Ready. Dog comes back, ouch, ouch. Comes back loose, and then he still kind of made that tiny pop. That 
And then so he were... has loud hands. Even though he has a very soft correction, you don't need it with this, this I almost called it a bit, with this uh, collar. You know, if, if there's any horse people out there, it's like having a leverage bit, a long shank leverage bit. The more inches you get of that bit, say there's, I don't know, horse jaw here. The more that it it moves down and curves, that's that much more leverage you have, or especially those that are like special in like the shape of an S. There's a lot of leverage you have there. So for one pound of pressure or one pound of pull, you may have five, 10, 15 pounds of pressure. That's kind of what he's getting with this here prong collar, you know, versus the slip collar versus the flat buckle collar. One pound of pull equals one pound of pressure. With the slip collar, maybe one pound of pull, you know, that he's tugging with his fingers gets five pounds of pressure. With the prong collar, one pound of pull might get 10 pounds of pressure. I mean, I, you know, there's no specific science to it. I'm sure there could be, but you see what I mean? Like, he, you, you can get away with doing less because you have a more intrusive tool on the dog. Me. A more aversive tool. Ouch, the ouch, ouch. turns off a little bit. Ouch. Good He's boy. still not giving this dog any reason to want to hang out with him other than avoiding pain. So I don't know what the point of switching from the slip lead to the prong collar, no matter what you switch to, he could be in a harness still, and the dog would still pull because he doesn't care about this guy. Then the next stage is teaching your dog what I call the magic green circle. And that might sound a little bit crazy, but I promise you, so you it walk absolutely in a circle? works. And if you can clearly communicate to your dog where their magic green circle is, you will have a Okay, dog. so I'm assuming like a hula hoops distance around the owner. That's my assumption. Or he's going to have them walk in a circle like a lot of people walk in a square so that they can correct the dog if the dog, you know, they make sharp turns so that they can kind of trick the dog. So the dog is always paying attention to them in some, you know, super freaked out mental state. The dog is, you know, never lets the person get away from them. That can walk beautifully on a loose lead to explore the world together. So what I'm starting And that's to where do proofing quite... comes from. Ouch. God. You just jerk. Loud hands. You know, oh, it's all about me. You know, never mind this poor little peasant of a dog that just has to be drug around by me that doesn't get to enjoy the walk. This dog just doesn't care about him. Or the correction. I mean, it, it cares enough about the correction, but apparently not enough to, you know, it just doesn't care. We call this free shaping. From what I know, I only thought that free shaping could exist in a world of positive reinforcement, which I guess makes sense that it could, you know, exist in a world without that. Where usually with free shaping, we have a dog that tries different behaviors, known behaviors, to get their reward. Hence a reward, meaning a treat, something they enjoy. So it keeps them wanting to guess, you know, guessing game. So say we have a ball on this field and we just want the dog to touch the ball with their nose. They walk around the ball and just, or they just look at the ball and we can mark and reward for them just engaging with the ball. Or we can wait um, until they get closer to the ball, whatever it may be. We start marking and rewarding for just being near the ball. Then the dog goes over and touches the ball or the, the dog goes to the ball and now they don't get a reward. And they say, okay, well, maybe if I touch it with my paw, then we can mark and reward for that, or we wait until they go to grab it with their mouth, and we mark and reward for that. We keep doing that. And you free shape by not giving them any specific instructions, but it, the idea is to give them a helping hand. You know, you don't just say, you know, okay, I've been doing this long enough, now you're ignoring me, now we're just going to keep on walking until you figure out to stay within this magic circle here, that when you get too far out, you're going to get correction so stay within this hula hoops distance of a circle. To me, I mean, I don't really see this free shaping, but I mean, I guess I, I could technically see it as that. I've just never heard it with compulsion trainers. And I'm sure he's going to call himself a balanced trainer. I don't see anything balanced about it. I see them as compulsion trainers. I'm going to show up and actually give him some attention. Okay, so here he could be rewarding him. This would be free shaping. If he wanders over there, if you wanted to do it with the leash, you know, if he wanders over there, he doesn't get anything. He comes back, reward. He wanders over here, he comes back for whatever reason, reward. Every time he stays here, he continues to get rewarded. Then he doesn't want to go over here because he got rewarded here. If you stopped rewarding here and you decided to change it midway, which would be confusing, but okay, then he might start wandering this way or other ways and trying different behavior. Maybe he might sit, maybe he may lay down, maybe he might try jumping up on you. They try different behaviors and they could be rewarded. In this case, the dog just has to stay here. Otherwise, when he goes out, instead of being rewarded, for doing something, his reward is not being corrected. So when he goes out, he's going to get corrected. When he stays in, that's his reward. It's just being in. Maybe he'll get a good boy. Is I'm drawing, imagine like a green circle that's attached to my left ankle. 
Pop. You can Ouch. make that circle as big as Ouch. you want it to be. I'm See, gonna... he's not really even... He's not paying attention enough to the dog to prevent this from happening. So that he doesn't have to let the dog pull as much. The dog is, again, so used to pressure that it's ignoring all of this. This hurts. But the dog is so interested in this, this grass where, you know, because it causes him to get nervous, he's pulling into a pool. That's the opposition Make reflex. Mine to start with. So Fair there, again, he could be rewarded. When he's in that green circle, that's like, ding, 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 it's good. There's no pressure. Again, he could be rewarded for hanging out circle. here. But when he's not, go. his reward is not getting corrected. And that's the amazing thing about dogs is they're so forgiving that they're so easily abused. Outside of that circle, I'm going to use a little bit of pressure. Now you've gone into like, um, you know those games where you've got that little circle. Again, focusing on what can make it easier for the human's life when instead he could be rewarding the dog. Not a single treat given, not a single reward the dog would be interested in. No option of that even. Well, yeah, yeah. Trying to go around the so mate. versus what he's telling you, this is what I'm seeing. If you touch it, it's like buzz. Mm. So you need to come back in. Yeah, but it's not a, a sound. It's it's a correction. Okay, so he talks about like you know a game or whatever it may be that you got. Eh, you get like the the correction noise, or maybe a tap because nobody wants to hurt a human because then you could have a lawsuit. You know, or people will let you know they'll fight back. But a dog, it's okay. We put a metal prong collar around their throat where they have the, the trachea, the esophagus, the thyroid gland. We have blood vessels. We have nerve endings. And whenever they get out of line, we're just going to pop them. Or we're going to tug on it because it hurts. That's okay. That's the equivalent to that buzz of the game. All I'm going to do is just shake. Because they can't talk back because they won't fight back. Him into this circle. What that does... Because when they fight back, then they're dominant, right? I don't, I don't know if this guy talks about dominance or not. I don't know much about him, but is then we just make really excuses for that. Him, that he's following me. Pulling. Then, well, okay, we... so he's pulling, and then we had a cut. What was that cut? Did he pop him? Did the dog yelp? What happened with that cut? Unless I'm just crazy. We'll go back. Is then communicates really efficiently Talking, to him dog pulls. that he's following me. Then, cut. We've got... So what happened between there and there? Okay, so dog is here. They're sniffing. They're pulling. Did he finally get irritated enough by the dog, by himself, really not paying attention to the dog? The dog keeps pulling, so he gave him a harsh correction? I don't know. Cut. Dog was there one sec, and they made a deliberate cut, and now he's here. What happened? His hand is different. So I don't know what happened. It, maybe nothing happened. I'm just, I don't then, know. When we've got that, and by not doing so, there is consequences. And that lack and of consequences pulling, is the root cause about consequences. For all of the, the consequences should not be on the dog. We're teaching them a human concept of control, manipulation. Let the dog be a dog. Yeah, I don't want a dog pulling me down either. But I don't go putting this on them and making them, you know, I don't teach by pain compliance problems that you've had because then when he's doing that bad behavior or he comes out of your green they circle put the, they always put the accountability on the dog you need to put the accountability on the person when you're out on walks it's just hey buddy nope drop back in but it's and not so much as a hey buddy back it's in, i'm using it behind the ear, food if he'll take it food if they'll take it they always take food if a dog doesn't take food they're sick they're over threshold or it's not a high enough value for them, or they, they're they dead, okay? They will always take food. And he's going to probably say that, you know, oh, I tried to give him food, and he didn't want it, blah, blah, blah. So here, let's go to this prong collar. This will work. The dog has no choice in it. The dog can't tell you yes or no, I don't want this on. Just the fact that we get to move on. So guys, I hope those top tips helped you. If they did, please give the video a full So we don't know how long they had to, you know, walk to get from pulling to the, the before and after... This is the before where he's pulling. Well, where, what area are they in? Are there cars nearby? Is there a noisy neighborhood? Are there kids? What time of day is it? You know, we also have him really short on the leash. Nope. Yanking, Drop yanking, yanking. Ooh, drops back in. To Scratch behind the ear. Food if he'll take. Prong collar and a different leash. And she has a lot more slack in it. And he's not holding on to it. She is. And they have a little poop bag. So they probably went for a little walk. The dog has had time to go to the bathroom. So we don't know how long it took for this dog to walk like this. Just things that I see that I point out using this, you know, as just another educational tool. 
Um, nothing personal against anybody here. I know it sounds like it. Like, I just take... I, I try to make a voice for the dog. I try to make it, you know, common sense. I try to point out the things that are in between the lines that these people will not tell you. You know, trainers like this, or even positive reinforcement trainers. I mean, I don't really see a whole lot of positive reinforcement trainers that I disagree with. I mean, there's some things, yeah, that I disagree with. Um, I talked about that in Zach George, but, you know, overall, I don't see much to cover with a positive reinforcement person because most of the time, I, it's not a bias. It's, I can watch them and see if they make a mistake, you know, but a lot of times, it's not detrimental to the dog, even if they make a mistake. You can, a mistimed click and reward is not going to hurt the dog nearly as much as a mistimed correction because then the dog will stop trying. So that's just my tangent for the day. Uh, let me know what you think this video. If you liked it, feel free to like it. If you didn't like it, then feel free to dislike it. If you want to subscribe for more, feel free to do that. You don't have to. Um, and let me know what you think about this, what you would like to see next time. And until then, stay positive.